So, to, so today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been pretty tunnel visioned on for the two weeks. Two weeks ago, um, our young adults attended the Faithful YA conference. And there, there are many parts to that uh, conference. A big portion, uh, a big portion of, 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 of why we put it together was so that the young adults could reconnect with one another. And so I'm an introvert, and so it was a challenging weekend for me because everywhere I turned, there was another person going like, Oh my gosh, haven't seen you in so long. Oh my gosh. And then I turn and there's another, Oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in so long. And I slept for the week after that because all of my social battery was gone. But another part of that young adults conference is I really believe that the Lord was speaking to the young adults during that weekend. And at the very end of the, of the two days that we were there, the worship team sang a song. And they sang a song that I was unfamiliar with at the time, but it's called Build Your Church. And because it was a new song, I don't know if you can relate to this church family where your spirit so wants to worship, but you don't know the lyrics. And so you kind of do like this, like in, in prayer, and then you like open up one eye to like look at the lyrics and then you go back and then, and then you try to keep looking at the lyrics or you do like the awkward, like half squinting thing, trying to look at the lyrics. So that was me for most of the, of the two days that we were there trying to learn all of the songs that at the end I just kind of stopped singing because I was like, I can't keep squinting. It looks a little bit odd. And so I stopped singing for a second. But what I heard all around me was 150 young adults. And these aren't just, sometimes we like to say like the next talk generation. About the young adults, talk but about we have to the realize adults, the young adults are the generation of the this generation age. Of this age. It's not next. Those are the youth now. We the are young adults, the generation, the generation of this day. Of this and, so day. Over and so over 150 of today's, of today's generation, generation leadership many in or leadership or many about to take leadership positions, many who are starting families, many who, um, are about in the next few years are really going to become the pillars of CLC are going to become the pillars of this church and 150 of us singing out desperately to God build your church I'm going to read the lyrics here the lyrics say I'm not going to sing it I'll just read it with a lot of emphasis no <laughs> I grab the guitar and I start like singing to you but the lyrics go build your church build your church Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build it from, build your church. How do I mess it up? I'm not even singing it. Build it from the ground up. We are your church. You see, many of the youth and YA conferences that I've personally been to, even the ones I've helped organize, many of the songs that we put on the set, lit are, are always, set list are always like, God set me on fire. God fill me, God use me. And there's nothing wrong with those songs, but I think that there was something so special about 150 of today's generation desperately singing out to God, God, build your church. Not just using me, but God, would you build the church that you want to build? And I don't know how to describe it. It felt almost like there was like a physical shift in the church when we were singing that song. It was almost like this rededication of the church back to God. That it was God, look at all CLC has built, look at what we've done, but God, would you continue to build your church? It felt like this, like I could, I don't know how to describe it. It felt like there was like this physical resistance. I don't know how many of you have ever gone like kayaking or canoeing. Side note, never go into a canoe with Janelle, Angel, Lana, or I. Because one time we were at the cottage and we found a boat and we're like, we're going to go out and we're going to kayak. It's big enough for four people. Like, this is amazing. And then we are paddling for like 15 minutes and we look back and we've only gone like maybe five feet. Because what happened is that we took the motor boat that was meant to like have a motor on the back of it. And we were trying to paddle it with like $25 paddles. That's just a side note anyways. But we were taking turns because we were getting tired. Our arms were getting tired trying to move this motorboat. But the person that was at the, we couldn't even tell what was the back and what was the front, if we're being honest. But whoever we thought was at the back was in charge of steering the boat. 
And when you're going forward, when you have forward momentum on a momentum on a boat, <laughs> if you put your paddle in at the back of the boat, you feel the water resist it. And based on the angle that you turn the paddle paddle, the water will resist against it. And that's what turns the boat and in the same way i feel like god in his mercy during that conference he was almost sticking the paddle into the boat not that the way we were going was bad but it's just him wanting to do something new it felt like a shift and in the same way i just can't get away from this topic and i don't believe it was just for the young adults i believe it was for the whole church so church family are you ready to dive into this topic today of building god's church the question i pose to us today is that is the church is the church that we are building really god's church and is he really the one building it not just ministry but the church in our homes the church in our relationships the church in which we um, commune with the father is the church we are building in our lives is it really god's church let us pray father god i just thank you that you have promised to us that you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Father God, I pray for the hearer of your word today, for each person here. I pray that they would be so alert and awake, Father God, for this message. Father God, I pray that this word would land on good soil and would transform hearts today. Father God, hide me behind your cross. Would every word that I say be in alignment with what you want to say to your church today? We just give you all the glory and praise in your name. Amen. So the main text we're going to be looking at today comes from the book of Haggai. I had to look this up so much because I thought it was like Haggai, but I looked it up on Google when I'm like, pronunciation. And it, someone said, it's like, ha, you're a guy. <laughs> Haggai. <laughs> so in the book of Haggai, chapter one, it's, this book is very short. It's only two chapters long. If you were to like go through your Bible really quickly, like the pages, it's so small, it would stick together and you could probably miss it in its entirety. But starting in chapter one, verse one, it says, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jezedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet guy. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled homes when this house, when God's house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm enough. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. Can you say build my house? Build my house. I've learned the secret. I don't like the sound of gargling like water noises. And so I often like don't want to drink water. But if I make you guys talk, if I make the congregation talk once, once more, build my house. You can't even hear it. Build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. You see, the book of Haggai, it's very, like, I read it and I'm like, cool, another example of the Israelites doing something once again, and God once again coming to, coming to uh, correct them. But the context of this passage, we're going to dive deeper into this word, but the, pa the context of this passage and the parallels that it draws are very important when understanding building God's church. Do you want to build God's church? Church? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. You see, the context of this book, before this, during the, the, around the middle part of the Old Testament, God sends prophet after prophet to warn the Israelites. The Israelites are God's chosen people. 
They are set aside, meant to be in covenant with God, but they keep breaking their promises to God. They keep sinning. And so God sends prophet after prophet to warn them. But time and time again, they choose to ignore the prophets and they continue to forsake the very God that saved them, the very God that pros prospered them. And so God's warning are no longer this faraway warning that will come. The time has come that they have refused to listen and the consequences are going to follow. And so God allows Jerusalem to be overtaken by the kingdom of Babylon. And when the Bible says that the kingdom, that Jerusalem was overtaken, it wasn't like they kind of like looked through their stuff and they took like what was valuable and they left. It was completely destroyed. The city was destroyed, the, their houses were destroyed, the temple where the Lord's presence resided was completely destroyed. It says even the foundations of it were destroyed. And most of the people in this city that were God's chosen people, God allows them to be taken as slaves and they were exiled from the promised land. See, the book of Haggai takes place what is believed to be 70 years after this exile. So God has allowed 70 years to pass in which, the, in which the Israelites are in Babylon. 70 years later, the Bab I feel like a history teacher. I'm all sorts of teachers today, I guess. The, his um, the history teacher. The Babylonians were then defeated 70 years later by the Persians. And so there's this new king, there's this new leadership, and the new king is like, why do you have all these slaves with you? And then he doesn't know what to do with it. And so the king of Persia gives a way out and says, all the Israelites that want to go back to Jerusalem, you can go. And you would think that this would be a popular offer, that lots of people would want to leave captivity, but it wasn't. It was not a popular offer. Only a small group of exiles wanted to return. That's not my topic of today, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about it another day, but... But a small part two, a small group of people that were trapped in Jerusalem, go back to Jerusalem, Babylon, go back to Jerusalem. And among the group that went back, there were those who remembered living in Jerusalem. Although it was 70 years later, there were some that were, that were alive during the exile who lived there. And they remembered the promised land and they remembered the divine favor that rested there. And so they go back in hopes that they can try to reestablish what once was, but they keep running into problem after problem. And that's the context of the book of Haggai. So if we go back to chapter one, verse two, it says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people talking about, I'm gonna call them the ex-exiles, because I think that sounds cool. <laughs> the group of ex-exiles, that's who the Lord Almighty is talking about. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. You see, at this point that the exiles return and then the book of Haggai takes place. Did I get more echoey? Okay. The point at which this passage comes is they've already actually tried, the ex-exiles have already tried to rebuild the temple. They actually spent a whole two years, good for them, they spent a whole two years trying to rebuild the temple. It was one of the first projects they started, and they had a great strong start. It was enough to build the foundation of the temple, and it was enough to build an altar. But then after two years, they began to become discouraged and distracted. And so after two years of work, they took a break. It was 14 years break. It was a 14 year break. So they worked on it for two years and then they took a break for 14 years. And so when, when the verse two says, these people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. That's what the ex exiles said for 14 years. It wasn't just a temporary excuse. It was for 14 years. Hey, when are we going to build God's temple so that he can reside with us once again? Oh, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. According to Enduring Word Bible Commentary, there were many reasons as to why um, this break was so long. There was hostile enemies who resisted their work. The land was still desolate after 70 years of neglect. The work was hard. They didn't have a lot of money or manpower. They suffered from crop failure and drought, and they remembered how easy they had it in Babylon. 
Looking at this from a surface level, I too am like the ex-exiles. My dad was recently working on the deck and he built this whole deck and he asked me, can you please stain the deck? And I was like, yes, I'm going to help my dad paint this deck. And I did like four planks and I said, I need a nap. <laughs> and looking at this from the surface level, I can empathize. The responses of the ex-exiles sound very wise and very spiritual, like the time has not yet come <laughs> to rebuild the house of the Lord. I'm just in a season right now where I just don't think God's opening a lot of doors for me to rebuild the house of the Lord. But if we take a closer look at this one verse, according to biblical scholars, God addresses the Israelites as these people instead of my people. Biblical scholars say it's never a good or perhaps sought after position to hear God to, to speak to his people this way, saying this people instead of my people. Even in the height of God's anger and dispro disapproval, he would more often than not call Israel my people still. In Jeremiah, he is in the midst of heavily rebuking the Israelites. He even compares them to prostitutes. But still, later in that passage, he says, and they will be my people and I will be their God. But in verse 2, it says these people. But biblical commentators infer he said this because he saw their excuses and their poor priorities and noticed that they were not living like his people. They were not living like his people, so he did not address them as such. Although they had good responses, God pushed past all of the fluff that they were saying and pinpoints that although they may be freed from Babylon, freed from slavery, because they ignored to build God's house, they were not acting like God's people. Continuing into verse 3 and 4, Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourself to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. Earlier in the passage, we see that the Israelites have a long <clears throat> list of reasons for not building the house of the Lord. They don't have the time. They don't have the money. God, we have no money. God, we have no food. We're just a small group of ex-exiles. How are we going to build your house? But God says within those 14 years, you were able to build paneled houses, not just houses to sleep or regular houses. Paneled houses talks about luxury homes. They were re rebuilding their personal homes, their estates, and they were living lavishly. Some biblical scholars say that the use of the word houses was not like there's lots of houses. It's that one person had multiple houses. It was enough for them to rebuild their like, I'll sleep in this one, and then I'll go to the cottage in this one, and then I'm in the Hamptons in this one, and then I have a New York apartment in this one. So God says, for 14 years, these people told me that they could not rebuild my house, but look at their paneled houses. And this isn't God giving this like false dichotomy, like you can either build your house or build the church. You can either build your career or build the church. You can either build your family or build the church. It's not one or the other. God is simply pointing out their hypocrisy that they say they cannot rebuild the house of the Lord, yet they themselves live lavishly. They themselves renovate their nice paneled open concept homes. Continuing in verse 5, it says, Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. God is saying, reflect on yourself. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your full, fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in them. He's saying, you don't want to build the church, and yet you're wondering why everything else around you isn't working out. You see, if our priorities are wrong, nothing will satisfy us. Dr. Tony Evans says about the ex-exiles that they had, the fact that they had time to repair their own homes says their failure to erect the temple wasn't a time problem, but a priority problem. And if I was God, I would be at my wits end with these people. Like, I banished you for 70 years, and then in my grace, I allow you to come back, and I welcome you, and I just ask that you build my temple, and you're out building vacation homes. I would have 
smited them on spot, on the spot. But how many of us are grateful that God is a God of mercy? Amen. In Haggai, verse, uh, continuing to verse 7 and 8, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. Why? So that he can have like a nice building to look at? No, so that I might take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Continuing into verse 9. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. This is how serious the Lord takes building his houses. That because the ex-exiles neglected to build God's temple, to build God's house, what happened, oh, I skipped ahead of my notes, but what happened was God called for a drought. That's how serious the Lord takes building his house. And it says, we can't get into it, but it says in, in chapter two of this book, what happens afterwards is not defensiveness or excuse. It simply says that the people obeyed the Lord. The people obeyed the Lord and began to build back up the temple. And although it wasn't as magnificent, like physically, they, did, they were a smaller group of people. They did have limited resources and it wasn't as magnificent as the original that was there before the ruins. Although it was not as aesthetically pleasing, the Lord still found delight in the Israel, in the, in, in, oh my goodness, in the Israel, erase that from your memory, please, in the Israelites' obedience. And he resided his presence within the temple. That's where we get the verse. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. The Lord's presence did not reside stronger in that place just because it was newer. It resided stronger because finally God saw a people that were united and chose to build his church the Lord declares when he sees their obedience that he would be with them. And you're like, great, Christine. Do you want me to go build a house now? Build a temple for God. Next life group, we're going out and we're building a temple in the woods. Be there 3.30 p.m. In the Old Testament, when we talk about building God's house, it means literally building God's temple. In the, um, the, but the picture that Haggai makes for us of physically building a temple 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 is merely a type and shadow it's a physical representation of how god intends to spiritually build his church you see in the old testament the only context for what god's temple is was was physical buildings if you ask what is god's temple it is physical buildings but how many of us know that the definition of what god's temple is changed after the life death and resurrection of jesus christ the definition of what is God's temple changed. And God says, don't you know that you are God's temple? Under the new covenant, people become God's temple. So we have now become God's temple. So then what does church building look like now? Matthew 16, 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, <clears throat> he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, 
and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I find it interesting that in the Old Testament, the way that God built his church was giving a command, and he had to give the command to the people to build my church. But in the New Testament, Jesus comes and he changes the narrative. He doesn't just say to other people, he's not God, no longer far away, just ordering people to build his church. Now he comes in the flesh and he says, I will build my church. You see, the order in the Old Testament was that God gives a command or God gives the word to the prophet. The prophet tells the people and the people must physically work in order to build the temple. But when Jesus comes, the order is completely switched. No longer is God just far away ordering his people, go over to that mountain and then bring that, back the materials and then build the church. Now Jesus, God in the flesh, he comes down and he says, I'm not just going to order you to build the church. I'm going to build the church. Jesus will build the church. I need you to get how untraditional this was. In the Old Testament, God always built his temple and his dwelling places by giving instruction for, for people to physically build. But here is Jesus saying, yeah, we're going to build the church, but I'm going to be the one who builds it. You see, the house of the Lord, the temple in the days of old, were able to be destroyed by human hands because they were built by human hands. The reason the Babylonians were so, could so easily tear down, like physically tear down the stones is because the temple was built by human hands, by faulty hands, by fleshly hands. But now Jesus comes and he says he will build his church. That he's not just going to be the designer who gives instructions from far away. He comes and he says, I'm actually here to build. And my hands are not faulty and my hands are not fleshly and my hands are not sinful. That's why it says the gates of hell will not overcome it because it was built by his perfect hands. And through Jesus' words, we can see that God no longer intends to only reside in secluded temples, which houses the presence of God, but only few can partake. But now when Jesus says that he is going to build his church, it changes from the word house to church. House was meant to represent like a physical building, but church, its definition is ecclesia, which is a group of called out people. That's right. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, it's not, I'm going to build physical things. I'm going to build my called out people. Yeah. That's what ecclesia means, a group of called out people. So what God now intends to build is no longer buildings, but it's people. That the start of the church starts with Jesus' strong, bold, and victorious statement. Jesus Christ, our firstborn, our beautiful Savior, our cornerstone, says, I will build my church. You see, before in, in, in Haggai, because the Lord is so holy, but because people were so steeped in sin and rebellion, the Lord, to a certain extent, had to remain at a distance and command people to build his house so that he could have the possibility just to commune with a few of them. But Jesus comes to close this gap that existed, to close the distance between creator and created, to close the distance between the father and his children. And I can't imagine, when I read Matthew, I can't imagine the excitement in Jesus' voice. That as soon as Peter, what does Peter say for Jesus to say, I will build my church? Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In other words, the first confession of a believer. This was the first confession of a believer in Jesus Christ. Peter was the first one to confess that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the Lord, that he is the Messiah. And what is Jesus' response to this? Yes, I am. Yes, I am the Messiah. And you know how, why I'm the Messiah? I'm going to build my church. He does not reveal his plans to save humanity from sin, although that does happen. He replies immediately, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. 
This isn't just him commissioning the building of his church. This is Jesus' victorious promise to his believers. His response to Peter, his response to the believer was, I will build my church. My promise to your confession to me, I hear that you're confessing that I am the Savior. I hear you saying that I am the Lord. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build you up, Peter. I'm going to build up the believer's and there, there are many areas in which the church needs to mobilize, but we must remember that it is God who is building his church. Dr. Tony Evans says, but when Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church, he uses the Greek word Petra, which was a collection of rocks knitted together to form a larger slab. Jesus' church then would be comprised of his unified followers who confessed him as the Christ, the son of the living God, as Peter did. So when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, and on this rock, on the confession of the believers, on the gathering of the believers, on the believers being unified with one another, that's how I'm going to build my church, building the church does not look like more programs or more buildings, although all of that is good and necessary. Continue to pray for buildings. Although it is necessary, Jesus came to establish a new order of what God always wanted, and that's for us to live in communion with him and to operate from a place of community and family. When we want to build the church, it no longer just means restoring physical buildings. If you take home one point today, take this home with you. Building the church is building up God's people. Building the church is building up God's people. When we ask ourselves, what does church building look like? It looks like building up people. If all of us are God's temple and I say, I want to build, I want to strengthen the Lord's house. What does that look like? It looks like helping people come into restoration. You know what the simple answer is? What does church building look like? It looks like evangelism and discipleship. It looks like evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism. When we look at the book of Haggai, what does God tell the, the Israelites to do? He says, go out to the mountains and collect materials from there and bring it back and use those materials to build the church. He doesn't say, he doesn't say go to the other temple and steal their, steal their rocks. <laughs> Go to the other temple and steal their rocks. It's already close by. Just, just steal their rocks. He says, go out. Go out to the mountains. Find the unrefined rocks. Find the rocks that have been sitting there dirty and alone. Find the rocks that have never been seen potential. And bring those rocks in. And use that to build the church. In the same way, we must go out and collect other rocks. We're all rocks. Looking, You all rock. You all rock. You all rock stars to me. <laughs> In the same way, we must go out and collect rocks who are, I, can't, I need to stop saying the word rocks, who are just as lost as we were to be welcomed into the family and to be built up. Get material that has yet to be polished. 1 Peter 2 verse 4 to 6 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. All of us were living stones rejected by men. But in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, precious, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Go out into the mountains and collect material. First is evangelism is how we build the church. Second is through discipleship. Have you ever wondered why so many verses talk about building up one another? If people are now the temple of God, then to care for, to rebuild the temple is to care for and bring people into restoration, discipleship. In the Old Testament, there is a picture of unity. When the people in Haggai build the church, build a solid unified building, that's when the presence of the Lord came to reside amongst them. That's when the favor of the Lord came down and the blessing of the Lord came down. And in the same way, when we are united, when we are in line with one another, and when we are in line with the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, that is when the Lord delights in sending his presence and favor. Yeah. The temple in Haggai is a picture of what happens 
when we are united and aligned with each other and with Jesus. Psalms 133, verse 1 to 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing, life forevermore. First Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur on one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that, you, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Ephesians 4.19, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. I could add so much more. God talks in the New Testament about building one another up because that's how he is building his church. To bring this full circle, at the, at the Young Adults Conference, there was a panel of six people and they were talking about their life experience. I may be remembering this entirely wrong, so if I tell a wrong story, everyone that went to the conference just look the other way and say, yeah, that happened. <laughs> but during the panel, um, one of the panelists gave a piece of advice and she said, programs, works, ministries, careers will all come and go, but people are eternal but people are eternal and it's better to invest in people because they are eternal. When we're talking about building up the church of God, the reason why the old temples were able to be destroyed was because it was from materials that could deteriorate. But now Jesus comes and he says, I'm gonna build my church and that my presence will reside in the temple that is you and I and you and I are eternal. In Jesus Christ, we are eternal. So when we invest in one another, when we invest in our life groups with one another, when we invest in our families, when we invest in each other, in the people that we see, it is more than the programs that we'll forget in the years to come. It's more than the buildings that will one day deteriorate. People are eternal. In closing, can I call the worship team up? So what then is building God's church. First, we learned in the Old Testament that building God's church looks like rearranging our priorities and to place God's will for his church over our own. Secondly, building God's church is to recognize that to build his church, it requires us to invest into people and to build them up. There is no building the church outside of community. There is no building the church outside the context of family, outside the context of people. There is a huge wave of like solo Christians who just stay at home and they're like, I don't need a church because I can watch so many sermons. I can learn so much. That's not building up the church. That's building up knowledge, which is good. We don't, we don't turn away from knowledge, but to build up his church requires us to build one another up as iron sharpens iron. I said earlier that I'm a huge introvert. If it was up to me, I would just kind of like be sitting at the back. Quite honestly, after I preach, I need to sleep for two days afterwards just to recharge all of my social energy. And if it was up to me, I would just like go to a random cabin like in the cottage town and just kind of be there. <laughs> but that's not growing the church. That's not growing the church. What good is programs and prestige if there are people still hurting, if there are people still alienated, lonely, in conflict with one another in the church? What good is a lot of numbers of a church when the people inside are still hurting? If we want to be used by God, if, we want, if, you, want some, if you want God to do something great in your, in, let me restart. If you want God to do something great with your life, and care for his people. 
building up his church, when we pray like, God, send me, God, use me, we think that we're going to be doing all these care for his people. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the same Peter who Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. He encounters Peter after he denies him three times. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter answers, yes, of course, Jesus, I love you. And what is Jesus' response? Then feed my sheep. Care for my people. Let's pray. Let us pray. We hope that message was a blessing to you. And if it was, feel free to share it on your social media platforms and bless your friends and family with it. And we also want to hear from you. So fill out the connect card that's found on the description box below and we'd love to connect with you. Also, follow us on Facebook at Champion Life Center Guelph to stay updated for the latest activities. Until next time, God, God bless. bless you.